Hi, in this slide I want to review some key dates uh, for how the business world has thought about the concept of supply chain economics, whether we're on the sell side, I call that service value chain solutions, or on the buy side, let's call that supply chain sort of math or, or purchasing. And basically all distribution channels in America grew up mightily with the creation of a post-consumer society after World War II. And uh, sort of certainly a landmark milestone date would have been in 1961 when Herbie Haft of Dart Drug in Washington, D.C. took Eastman Kodak and a bunch of other uh, consumer manufacturer brand name companies all the way to the Supreme Court and had fair trade laws struck down. Prior to that, if you sold uh, these branded products at below the manufacturer's list price, they could not sell you. They could, they could deny selling you, so you couldn't be a discounter. Once that happened, it's not coincidental that the next year there were actually three startups. Uh, the Sebastian S. Kresge Corporation, S.S. Kresge Corporation, started a spin-out business called Kmart. The Dayton Hudson Company started a spin-out business called Target. And, and Sam Walton closed down his Ben Franklin no brand name stores and opened up his first Walmart, which really was a knockoff of a Kmart store that had been opened up. But his, his approach was to go to small towns and reach them with two-step distribution with a central warehouse in Bentonville. Whereas Kmart said, let's just put a big box in a big city and ship the stuff directly into the store. But Walmart's motto was, we're going to sell brand names. That's commodities you already know and like. We're just going to sell them for less. We're strictly discounting. By 1974, there was a, a, a big database project that actually was started by General Electric called the Profit Impact Market Strategy Database. And by 1974, they proclaimed that return on investment for corporations was directly correlated to the volume of their market share defined by a product, but sort of in a generic way. Like, uh, you know, the guy who sells the most toilet paper in St. Louis, Missouri, is going to be the most profitable toilet paper distributor. Um, so it was a, a generic definition of market share, and it seemed to work. But by 1978, that had fallen apart. And PIMS people were scrambling around and so forth. Over time, over the next, I don't know, five, eight years, it, they started to realize that the key was how you defined the market share you were dominating. In other words, there still were economies of scale that were possible, but they were within a very tight scope or niche. And these niches now started to be more customer centric. In other words, if you go after a certain kind of customer, and they buy a category of products, how do those products, are they tuned for that particular customer niche, and do you have the right mix of items for that niche, and so forth. Um, a next breakthrough sort of supply chain event was in from 83 to 86, Walmart started testing on a pilot test basis, you know, tin cans and strings and so forth, uh, a continuous replenishment uh, information system. So when a particular shirt was sold at the checkout counter, that information was relayed not just to Walmart's distribution center, but to the shirt manufacturer and to the, the people who made the dye for the shirt and the people who made the textiles for the shirt. And if everybody could have an a open uh, purchase order, get it there just in time, replenishment uh, ar arrangement or partnership, it could dramatically improve the fill rates, lower the investment inventory, and take a lot of cost out because it was basically a peopleless, paperless uh, kind of business. And uh, they, Walmart did that with the textile industry because the textile industry was concerned about uh, Chinese imports. <laughs> they, they, that was just the beginning of Chinese imports in 1983. So, America, so Walmart was in the southeast where there were a lot of textile mills and a lot of their customers worked in textile plants. So that's when they also came up with their Buy American program in 1986, which they obviously uh, stopped doing a long time ago. Um, so that gets us up to 1986. And once Walmart discovered this incredible breakthrough uh, solution, they said, well, who is the single biggest supplier of consumer goods? And let's partner with them on this new platform. So they, in 1986, they approached Procter & Gamble. And they said, here's what's going on, and da 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 da. So Procter & Gamble set a vice president down there, and they had 60, 70 employees at any one time down there in Bentonville for about two years. And so from 1986 to 1988, P&G 
basically made this 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 stuff their all their products flow through the distribution centers lights out cross docking the whole deal um, and it was such a powerful breakthrough Walmart said golly with this platform we can actually get into groceries from a standing start and do very well and in fact they did by 1990 they started opening up super centers and today they have over 35 percent of the national grocery sh share uh, uh, volume in 1988 Sam Walton fired independent territory sales reps who were on commission he said I don't want to see these reps anymore rather what I want to do is I only want to deal with executives who understand supply chain economics and are empowered to work with us hand in glove to make this integrated uh, replenishment demand replenishment system work and uh, you know the National Rep Association got you know uh, protested and so forth, but obviously Sam being the customer got his way. Other trends were going on from 1980 to 1990 uh, in the drug wholesale channel. Uh, there were lots of independent drug wholesalers working on a 14% gross margin out of the warehouse, and that a new business model emerged where they worked on about 6.5% out of the warehouse, but instead of selling, getting 20, 30, 40, 50% share of a, of a, of a drugstore's business, uh, they'd get 100% and the customer themselves would detail their shelves with uh, Telzon uh, scanner capability and feed the order through the phone right into the distributor's computer so there were no inside salespeople at all and uh, so the average order size went up 12 fold etc so the, the, the business model was dramatically different but because the cost of taking care of the drug store customer dropped so much that's what the afforded the big price discount or the lower margins and the net of it all was the drug wholesalers picked up enormous additional share of stuff flowing through drug stores the return on investment went up and of course the channel consolidated mightily because a lot of wholesalers just couldn't figure it out and want to keep doing business the way they always been doing it Another key development was in the 90s, the, the big ERP software vendor, SAP out of Germany, started to uh, install their, their ERP platform in all kinds of large manufacturers across the United States. And one of their capabilities, as far as their processes in their package, was something called central spend management. So this would allow somebody at headquarters to monitor all the consumption of safety gloves at 35 different plants and ask the question of why are we buying 4,900 different individual SKU item numbers of, 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 of safety gloves at 35 plants from, from you know, 200 different vendors. Isn't there a way of, of getting consolidation benefits out of this? So that was the beginning of what in distribution channels we call integrated sole supply for MRO items. It really started taking off and has had its own life cycle uh, ever since. Let me clean this up here a little bit. The, um, in a, while that was going on uh, in the 90s, also private equity had gotten had its own had its own life cycle. It took off phenomenally in 1982. Long story behind that. Uh, Mitt Romney started Bain Capital in 1982. His timing was very good from a life cycle viewpoint. But a lot of private equity money came in to, to consolidate distribution channels to the point where the consolidation of distributors even got to have its own life cycle and sort of peaked out almost in a bubble when we started having kind of what were called poof roll-ups. You know, 20 companies would throw their stock into one pot, take out a general stock, and try to go public right away. A lot of them didn't do so well. Uh, from 95 on, thanks to health maintenance corporations that started in California and rolled across the country, hospital supply channels consolidated along with the hospitals themselves. So as hospitals consolidated, they realized they'd get cost out, so they started to consolidate their vendors and go to, with big supply chain deals. So several hundred independent hospital supply distributors became four national footprint kind of companies. Um, also, during the 90s, it became fashionable to change the name for the vice president of purchasing of big corporations to become the vice president of supply chain. Uh, the Trade Association, the National Association of Purchasing Managers, picked up on this filing and changed their name to the Institute of Supply Management. 
Um, and lastly, because the life cycles for products, particularly that had chips in them, like uh, you know computers, PCs, uh, now today smartphones or DVDs, we remember they 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 went through a very fast life cycle. The life cycles moved so quickly that we started to be mindful of them and realize that each stage of the life cycle re required different kinds of strategies, different kinds of field sales. Uh, skill sets and compensation, and a fellow named Jeffrey Moore wrote a series of books on uh, on on life cycle strategy thinking. So we'll take a look at that next. Thanks.